Previously, researchers had identified 20 to 25,000 genes in the human genome. However, building on the widely accepted one gene, one protein hypothesis at the time, it was puzzling since scientists knew that there were at least 70,000 human proteins out there. Now there was a new question at hand, how more proteins can be synthesized from a set genome. And this is how we land ourselves at alternative splicing, a growing field focusing on the transcriptome, the transcribed portion of the genome. How do we go from DNA to proteins? Here's a quick refresher before we get to the real deal. DNA is transcribed into messenger RNA. This transcript is translated as sequential amino acids bond into polypeptides and aggregate into functional proteins. This seems simple enough, but how do we get different proteins from the same multi-exon gene? What even is alternative splicing? Oh, maybe Chatter knows. Of course I know. Well, we have a mRNA transcript with multiple exons, one, two, three, and four. The dashed lines represent the regions to be spliced out. Here, only the introns will be removed and the rest spliced back together. What if the splice junctions include a whole exon? Yes, it will be removed too. Last example, will exon two be removed? Yes. These mature transcripts are then translated into different proteins. Look at the first example again. Each exon encodes a subunit. They aggregate to form a four part protein. The second example with three coding regions makes a three part protein. Lastly, this transcript has three different exons. A different protein is translated. We can see that from one pre-mRNA, three different mature mRNAs are alternatively spliced, which translates into three different proteins. Each protein subunit originates from the corresponding exon. The more splicing junctions, the more alternative splicing combinations. Nifty. Wow, that is pretty cool. Wait a moment, how are regions removed from a transcript in the first place? Wow, you're a really curious one, aren't you? Let's get right in. The process of splicing is controlled by parts of a dynamic complex known as the spliceosome. Small nuclear ribonucleic proteins, SNRPs, gather around and identify splicing signals in the precursor mRNA, U1 and U2, recognize and bind, while other proteins join the party to help unwind and bend the correct sides in position. This rearrangement optimizes the confirmation required for the splicing reaction to occur. The regions are cleaved by consecutive transesterification reactions where the ends join back together after the spliceosome is released. What? That's amazing. Thanks, Chatter. I wonder if Petri knows what's going on in the research world. We want to understand the functional complexity of higher eukaryotes and know everything about the human transcriptome. However, older technology has limited the analysis of human tissues until my colleagues at the University of Toronto were able to conduct a deep analysis of the human transcriptome. High throughput sequencing technology was used to analyze multiple DNA molecules and derive mRNA splicing junctions. I see Petri, that sounds cool. But before you tell me more, what has been done previously? Well, before human testing, it was more appropriate to test on ourselves, you see. Mice tissue analysis using high throughput sequencing gave us hope that the same technology could increase the depth of human tissue analysis. Now with the new technology, researchers isolated six human mRNA sequences of whole brain, cerebral cortex, lung, heart, liver, and skeletal muscle datasets. The human splicing regions previously identified were stored in a database. Scientists didn't want to double up on what they discovered. So, a junction library was searched using the six tissue reads and compared against previous data. This allowed them to identify all the true positive junctions and isolate the new from the known. How cool! From the 15,702 genes in six tissues, surveying detected an upper limit of 11,099 new splice junctions. This is a rate of 20% new detection in the multi-exon genes. After combining both the known and the new data, it was observed that 95% of multi-exon genes contain at least one alternative splicing event. Something fascinating is the specific tissue proportion distribution of new splice junctions. The most frequent present in whole brain and cerebral cortex tissues, which is unsurprising given this reflects the cellular complexity of increased alternative splicing frequencies. So what can we do with these results? Identifying and quantifying splicing junctions gives us a greater insight into human cellular complexity. Further, the results and methods of the study can be utilized as another lens to view divergence and evolution. 
we can see how changes to available splicing junctions can have widespread effects on protein products. For now, technology limits us, but extrapolation can estimate the total number of alternative splicing events in all human tissues to be at a rate of 7 per multi-exon gene. Now that's crazy to imagine. With more full coverage, surveying technology to come, there is endless discovering to do. So remember to stay curious and enjoy the learning journey.